Good evening. Welcome all as we gather together for worship this Saturday evening. And also welcome to everyone who's worshiping with us online. Uh, glad that we could all gather together this Lenten season as we continue with our series, Our Greatest Needs. Some of our greatest needs uh, will be provided, as we hear in John chapter 3, uh, with God's gifts for the world. Let us rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. brothers and sisters in Christ, as we come to worship our Almighty God, we humble ourselves and admit that we have broken his commandments in many ways. Let us confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. We pray, most merciful God, we confess to you all our sins and iniquities with which we have offended you in our thinking, in our speaking, and in our doing. Too often we have ignored the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We have failed to listen to your word. We seek your forgiveness. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, poor sinners. Heavenly Father has heard your prayer. By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has purified your heart. Your sins are forgiven. 
May the same Holy Spirit strengthen your faith in Jesus and restore the joy of our salvation. Amen. Purify my heart. Touch me with your cleansing fire. Take me to the cross. Your holiness is my desire. join our hearts and voices in the prayer of the day for the second Sunday of Lent. And we pray, Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We turn to the Word of God for this week. The Old Testament lesson for the second Sunday of Lent is taken from Moses' book of Numbers, chapter 21. Uh, just to set the scene a little bit, uh, it's almost time to go into the Promised Land. The 40 years of wandering in the wilderness are almost done. And the Lord gave them a victory, and they figured they could just march right up into the promised land, but instead he led them in the opposite direction, and the people didn't like it. They complained, and they were in rebellion. So God sent snakes, poisonous ones, and the entire incident points us to the cross of Christ. We'll hear more about that as, as Jesus talks. We read, They, that's the, the Israelites, traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of the Lord. Our theme verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life.
our epistle lesson is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. St. Paul reviews the grace and love of God and our desperate need of it. We all were, once you could say, bitten with snake bites that were venomous. We all have a sinful nature and we all were dead in that sin, as Paul says. But God has rescued us. He has brought us to faith. It's all by his grace. So Paul writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of our Savior. And so let us rise and confess our faith in the triune God with the words of the Apostles' Creed. So we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the lowly Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our sermon hymn, To God Be the Glory.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. The Word of God is our gospel lesson for this week, and it's taken from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Uh, let us rise to give honor to the words of our Savior. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into, into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the word, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, have you ever spent some time watching some of the old reruns on uh, cable channels and various kinds? I think back to when situation comedies were basically clean and they presented difficulties in a family situation. Uh, think back to Andy Griffith and Leave it to Beaver and My Three Sons and Dick Van Dyke. And I suppose if you're a little bit younger than I, you might be thinking of uh, Friends or Seinfeld or some of those. A anyway, the, the point is, is that we have a rerun for tonight. And the rerun it happens to be the movie called John 3. John 3.16 is the one that we hear off very often. And I, I, I haven't seen anyone holding up a sign at football games lately on TV that says John 3.16. It used to happen all the time. Either people are not doing it anymore, or what's more likely, uh, the networks aren't showing it. They'd rather have all of the funny signs. It, it, at any rate, we're looking at not only John 3.16 tonight, which is a very special, important rerun, but I want you to see the whole picture surrounding it. Sometimes people have called John 3.16 the gospel in a nutshell. In one sentence, the whole gospel is there. But I want us to see the whole nut, not just one part of it. But I was looking back and thought, well, this is something you probably figure too that I've spoken about uh, this chapter uh, many times. And I will admit that the one verse has been the subject of Christmas sermons, and, and, and many other times I quote it and refer to it, but I was looking back 
And for the entire gospel lesson that we just heard, I've only preached on that on two other times in 45 years. So it's time to review our rerun. And it's very important because we find some special nuggets and and things that the Lord wants us to remember and hear. Uh, we have gifts for the whole world to satisfy our greatest needs. And we will see that in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, all the time, and give the facts of uh, who the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is and what they have done. But Jesus is trying to reach all of our hearts, not just recite a creed. And so when we look at what he teaches uh, a man named Nicodemus, we see something that can touch our hearts and not just have a bunch of facts that we have memorized in our heads. So we see uh, God's gifts for the world and the first and greatest gift of all is that the Father gave his Son. I want you to observe as we take apart our gospel lesson a rerun called Nick at Night. You might have heard of that, but we have Nick, Nicodemus is his full name, and he comes to Jesus at night. So that's our rerun from the gospel, Nick at night. And why did Nicodemus come in the middle of the night? Well, he was one of the prime leaders of the religious group called the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel. He knew his word of God. He had studied the Bible a lot, but he had questions. What was Jesus all about? Who is he anyway? And he knew that so many of his companions in the Pharisee group had already turned against Jesus and were opposing uh, the Lord in any possible way that they could already. So Nicodemus thought it might be better if he really wanted to get the truth to come at night away from anyone else so he could ask his questions and approach Jesus directly and hopefully find some truth for himself. He was a great Bible teacher, but there were some things that he just could not comprehend. And so we hear the beginning of the interview. Uh, Nicodemus says to Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus recognizes something, someone very special here with Jesus. He had to have come from God. Not only is he teaching great wisdom, but he is backed it up by many, many miraculous signs, miracles, good miracles, helpful miracles. And so Nicodemus concluded, this man has, has to have come from God, and he wants to find out more. So Jesus reveals that gospel nugget that we often have. I'm going to skip toward the end because here's where we see the Father's gift to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that would be something quite shocking for Nicodemus. Why? Jesus is calling him the only begotten son of the Father. The one and only son is another way of translating that. But perhaps that triggered in Nicodemus' mind something from the Psalms, which he would know very well. In Psalm number 2, it said, God, the Father is speaking in the Psalm and says, You are my son, and he's talking about the Messiah. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And so Nicodemus, by hearing the only begotten son, would recognize that Jesus is the son from heaven, 
now begotten and brought to this world. And what's more, uh, God sent the only Son because he loved the whole world. And that too would be rather shocking for uh, a typical Pharisee because we are God's people. We have his word. We're trying to follow it our very best. And God loves the whole world. The whole world doesn't deserve it like we do. The whole world, he loves even the Romans. You got to be kidding. But God so loved the world. All people, no matter who they are or what they have done. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That was a shock to Nicodemus. Why? He was a good Pharisee. And even though they believed in God, uh, it, how was their way to heaven? Their way was to obey all of the commandments as good as possible. You shall pray, pay, and obey. Just do it all. And then if you, people out there, if you are like us Pharisees, then maybe you will make it to heaven. But Jesus turns that apple cart upside down and says, just believe. Uh, the Father gave his Son... The Son is going to do everything for our salvation, so we believe in him. We accept what he has done for us. It's a gift. It's a gift for all the world that is not something that we have to do in order to be saved. Most people feel that it's very important to do things even for salvation. I would agree it's important to do things, but it cannot ever contribute to our salvation. Uh, there was a, a, a baking company once that had put together a cake mix, a cake mix in a box, and all you had to do was add water and stir it up and bake it, and everything would be just great, but it failed. No one wanted to buy it. Why? Just add water? That can't be a very good cake. And so they added other ingredients to make few people feel better. You gotta add oil and egg and a few other things to make this cake just work just fine. And then people thought, yes, it's gotta be a good cake. It's got some good ingredients in it. And so very often people in their minds think, yes, Jesus is my savior, but I've gotta add all the rest of the ingredients so that I might be saved. Just believe in him? I've got to contribute more to my salvation, don't I? And God says, no. Matter of fact, Jesus has done it all. And that's why we see our next gift for all the world, that the Son gave his life. So that we might have faith, and so that we might have life by faith alone, Jesus use the example of what God did for the Israelites in the desert. Do you remember what I just had read? The people were complaining, didn't like how God was leading them. It was uh, just the opposite direction the way they wanted to go. They were complaining against God, it says, and against Moses, and they were just totally upset. They didn't, didn't like what God was doing. So they soon found out that God's anger is a worse thing than uh, it, it going in the wrong direction. The venomous snakes came, they were bitten, some of the people died, and as God instructed Moses to make a bronze snake, put it on a pole, and when they would look at it, just a, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. That's exactly what had happened back in the Old Testament. I doubt if Moses had a clue that as he was making this snake and putting up on a pole, that it was a beautiful picture of Jesus. Yes, when the people were bitten, they can look at it and live for this earthly life. The venomous snake didn't kill them, but only Jesus lifted up on the pole of the cross 
could give us eternal life simply by seeing him and trusting in him. That's what faith is, receiving the gift that God has given us. Oh, it's always so hard to admit, as I said earlier in the reading, that we all have been bitten by venomous snakes. We all are subject and doomed to death. But as we look to Jesus, we have our eternal life. And that's a gift for all the world. Jesus sacrificed himself to pay for every sin that has ever been committed. But now it's important to really look at him and see who he really is and bring that into our hearts. You see, it's, it's very, very simple to say God loved the whole world. The Father gave his son. Jesus gave his life on the cross. But up to that point, those are just facts for the whole world. Not everyone in the whole world is going to accept it and believe it. And that's where we see the next gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit gives us life. That's the reason why I skipped the first part of our text until now, because that's where it comes home to us and into our hearts. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus that there was something very important that he needed. He says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus never heard of something like that before. You could see him kind of scratching his head and saying, how could a man be born when he's old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. What do you mean, Jesus? I never heard of anything like this before. But Jesus is making clear that we need all of us to be born again, born a second time, born by the Spirit. Sometimes people in our world today in the Christian circles talk about being a born-again Christian. And I suppose what they mean by that is, I'm a Christian, I'm a born-again Christian, I really have the Spirit in my heart, I'm a committed Christian, I'm doing my very best to follow the Lord, not like some of those other Christians out there that seem to be do, going through the motions and just saying it. Well, guess what? Unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Every Christian is a born-again Christian, not just some. We all need that second birth. And what in the world is he talking about? Jesus explains further, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit, capital S. Flesh gives birth to flesh. That's when we celebrate our birthday. And the Spirit gives birth to spirit. That's our living spirit on the inside. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the gift of a new life. And so we are born again, what? Of water and the spirit. Jesus doesn't use the word, but there's only one thing that fits that criteria. It's our baptisms. There we have the Holy Spirit giving faith or strengthening faith to anyone who is baptized. The, the water is symbolic of washing away all of our sins, and the Holy Spirit comes to us and gives us a new life. And certainly that's why we baptize our little ones too, because even though they can't comprehend anything, the Holy Spirit can certainly come to a person of any age, even a little one and give them the new life in Christ. So that's why Jesus makes it so important to say, you want to enter the kingdom of God? You need to be born again in holy baptism, born of water and the Spirit. That is what the Lord is providing us through the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, you can have all the facts in your head, but unless the Spirit comes to us through his means, whether it's the word of God or holy baptism, uh, we will not have a new life. It's all by God's grace. So 
what are we going to do with this? How does that impact our life? God has given us many gifts for our salvation. Are we going to just simply say, that's good, thank you God, and just go on our way and do whatever we want? Imagine a young man is looking for a wife and he wants someone who will cook the meals and take care of the house and treat him with affection and kindness, but he doesn't listen to what she has to say. He ridicules and belittles her in public. Uh, Does he really love that person? I don't think so. Or take a teenager. The teenager wants money, the keys to the car, freedom to do what he wants, but you expect me to obey the rules of this household? That's ridiculous. Does he really love anyone in the family? I don't think so. Let's apply that to the Christian family. If we want all of what God is giving to us for free as a gift and say, well, That's no big deal. I'm going to just do what I want. That certainly does not compute, does it? It, it, Are we showing love back at all? Well, of course we will. Uh, We love because he first loved us. He gave us his wonderful gifts. The Father gave his Son. The Son gave his life. The Holy Spirit brings life into our hearts. How can we not respond as part of this wonderful and special family. And and so we will do the things that God wants. In the epistle lesson, we heard about how God has created us by his handiwork to perform good deeds. St. Paul uh, talks about all of that. He said in Romans 12, in view of God's mercy, by his mercy and grace, you received everything you really need, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So in response to God's gifts, we do more than say a thank you prayer. That's good, but that's only a start. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, Not like the animal dead sacrifices, but we have life and we want to put it into action to show our love for all that God has given us. And that is our true and proper worship. So all the opportunities we might have to serve the Lord, I can think of so many things that we want to do together as a congregation. I can think of many things that you want to do for your family or for other people around you. Certainly, we have the opportunity to receive God's gifts and share them back. One one of the things for our mission statement is the word shine. After we arose in faith and are energized, then we want to shine, and we encourage everyone to do at least one thing for the Lord in our congregation. We're working real hard right now, too, in getting our teens more and more involved with things for our congregation Pick out one thing if you aren't already doing some already and see how you can show God's love in return in all that you do. By the way, that's what Nicodemus did. What is the end of his story in the Bible? Nicodemus went to Pilate after Jesus had died along with Joseph of Arimathea. Both of them were on the Sanhedrin, the Council of Seventy, who were earthly responsible for Jesus' death. But these two no longer stayed in hiding. They truly had believed that Jesus was the Savior and Messiah. So they stepped up at that critical moment, asked Pilate for his body, and Nicodemus spent a small fortune on 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes with which to wrap Jesus' body as they buried him in Joseph's new tomb. Nicodemus was willing to sacrifice not just money, 
but I'm sure he sacrificed his position in the leading council, uh, but that didn't matter. He was going to follow the Lord who had died for him, and in just three days, he would see the victory as he rose from the dead. May all of us who know all those facts from the creed and the Bible put them into practice in our lives. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And let us sing, Worthy is the Lamb. rise for prayer. <clears throat> and in our prayers this evening, uh, we turn to the Lord for his guidance and love and thanks for all of his gifts. I also like to say a special prayer uh, for uh, uh, Betty Bruckmeyer, that would be Betsy's mom, who is now in hospice care at home. And the Lord may soon take her home to heaven. Also, I'd like to pray for the Gallagher family. Uh, this morning, I had a special memorial service. Uh, his name is Frank uh, Gallagher, Jr., a young man, 41 years old, heart failure. And so the family I've known for quite a while. And we had a special service to give comfort and solace to his parents and others in the family. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Holy Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant us strength, patience, and endurance. We pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, 
those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, grant them a strong faith. We thank you for all of the people on our prayer list who are recovering from many difficulties. We see your hand of answer and healing for so many. But at this point, we pray especially for Betty Brokemeyer. It seems, O oh Lord, that you might be guiding her to her heavenly home soon. So keep her strong in the faith, even as her body weakens, and assure and comfort her family as well. And give that same strength and comfort to the Gallagher family as they had an unexpected goodbye to their oldest son. Continue to bless them and guide them because, Lord Jesus, as you promised, you are the resurrection and the life, and whoever lives and believes in, me, in you will never die. Assure us of a heavenly home for all who believe in you, that we might live forever in your grace. All these things we pray in your name, and also join in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of God's name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. be seated for our closing hymn verses. to welcome all of you here and welcome those that are online with us still. Uh, thank the Lord that we could hear his word and uh, rejoice in all that he has done for us. I'd like to just mention what's coming up this coming week. Uh, on Wednesday, we continue with our online Bible study. Uh, first of all, the passion history as we go through the events of Jesus' passion or suffering for us. And then the tie in with that, uh, with the life of Abraham, just as Jesus received insult and injustice as he was arrested, so we see uh, those who have insulted God uh, face their just deserts in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, chapter 19 of Genesis will be our study from the life of Abraham. And then we continue with our greatest needs next week. It's water for the thirsty. 
would like to also mention that uh, tomorrow afternoon, Sunday afternoon after the service, about 1230, we'll be having another call meeting uh, to extend a divine call to an associate pastor to work with me. Uh, I think all of you know that the most recent call uh, was return, and so we will try again with God's help and blessing. And uh, there's a lot of things in the bulletin also about a upcoming mission rally, uh, which is being held not too far away. Our sister congregation in Maitland, King of Kings Lutheran, will host that. Uh, that will be on Saturday, March 9th. I can't believe that March is just around the corner already. So please keep that in mind. There's a sign-up sheet out there as well. So may God continue to bless us as we follow him in our lives. Thank you.